Hello, it's Scott Manley here with episode 21 of the Interstellar Quest. This is our space station in orbit, our long, uh, I don't know, long habitation f- testing facility. It doesn't really do anything except look cool and give me an option to muck around with things and see how the life support works. Uh, that being said, the life support is uh, functioning correctly. We're recycling water and we're uh, scrubbing our filters so that we uh, can reprocess uh, carbon dioxide and get a uh, clean air out of it. Meanwhile, back on the planet, uh, I've realized that since I'm launching a spacecraft to uh, Joule, we're going to need even a longer range communication system. So I built this little, uh, I don't know, this little tripod thingy here. Uh, this is a base station that is able to reach out all the way to Duna. It's on wheels, I could, or not to Duna, to Joule. It uh, rolls around to the t- location in question and then uh, pops out these legs, sits still. It's powered by a little nuclear reactor in there. And best of all, it has a steerable dish so we can uh, you know, point it at the moon to investigate the signals that are coming from there. But of course, the aviation team are the ones that are interested in those. Uh, yeah, so that will be my base station, just so you know. Moving on, we have, uh, well, we have more building to be done. So, I want to go to Duna. The thing about Duna is that it's a 200 plus day voyage to that target and I've realized that I really want to do this right. So I'm in this interesting situation where I want to install 0.23 uh, Kerbal Space Program with the limited science issue, well the new science issues, the science lab and things like that, but I haven't been able to because things like B9, KW rocketry and some others still haven't been updated. So I'm building a spacecraft to go to Duna. This is going to be a pretty epic voyage because we have to sustain Kerbals for 200 plus days and although those guys in the space station are, uh, they've been there for like 20 days and they're already feeling kind of cramped because there's three of them and there's only room, uh, only a small amount of room. So the thing that goes to Duna is going to have to be huge. It's going to have to give them enough room that they can happily sit there for like a year and not get too freaked out by their limited space. Uh, I don't think there's any mod for this. There's no mod that makes the Kerbals psychotic if they spend too much time in close proximity to each other. So I know, yeah. The first thing about the Duna uh, probe is we need a drive system. And as uh, you've seen in the past, it's better to have a pooler-based drive system where you have uh, rockets up the front firing backwards down the side so that that everything is kept under tension. Well, that's what this is intended to be. Now, you can probably barely see it, but I do have two, uh, two nuclear rockets on the front there attached to a fuel tank. Nothing particularly fancy here. Uh, those, uh, the whole, uh, well, the whole idea here is that I want to fit everything inside a fairing. And if you've seen my previous pooler style designs, they generally have rockets that stick out over the edge. And so that doesn't fit neatly into these fairings. I mean, obviously the fairings are really uh, influencing or driving the design decisions here. So what I've got is uh, these are articulated and you can just about see them folding back out of their fairing now. Isn't that beautiful? So that, I've now built a a pooler drive system, which will, uh, oh, it's, I guess it's going to be dawn for them there. That uh, that means that everything will be kept under tension. That will go at the front, we'll have some fuel tanks behind it, and then we'll build out the rest of the spacecraft. And it will all go to Duna, and everybody will be happy, and there will be no space psychopaths, because space psychopaths are just not good storytelling, really. It's a cop-out a lot of the time. Especially, you know, if you're talking about Steve Buscemi and Armageddon. What ridiculous space craziness was that? Besides, why was there a Gatling gun on a rover? I've no idea. I still love that movie as being ridiculous and over the top, but that was very silly. Moving on, we have to start building this thing out. So, this is going to be the fuel tank. Now, you might notice that this is probably bigger than anything I've built uh, so far. This is the by far the biggest spacecraft I've built at this point. A uh, large part of this is the fuel tank that's going to go up, then we have some adapters up the top hidden behind that fairing. Obviously all this is in post-commentary because this spacecraft is taking way too long to build. There's far too many trips and it's a hard job to make everything all fit together when I can't actually, when I haven't been able to test them until I actually launch them. It's always kind of hilarious to test something and then find out that it falls apart. So up the top, that is my little space tug. It uh, is going to pull and maneuver things into orbit and then return to Kerbin when it is done. Uh, 
It is a prototype. This one is a lot larger than the one that we tested on the space plane. Uh, it, however, has to perform the orbital insertion. That's why it has plenty of uh, plenty of RCS this time. It has a larger probe body. You see it has a big antenna sticking out the front there. And, uh, yeah, some batteries. We also have some uh, SES units. Now, yes, you noticed that I d realized that I didn't have enough fuel in that launch stage. So I transfer some fuel from my Duda stage... Uh, meaning that we will have to send refueling spacecraft to it. Unf That's just the nature of things. We just didn't get things figured out properly. Um, this has basically been my last couple of weeks. Uh, I've I've scrapped so many designs. I've started building things in the vehicle assembly building and then realized that they were just not going to work. They were too heavy. They were too fragile. They couldn't be launched inside the fairings. Really, launching inside those fairings is, is a really hard job, and I, I don't want to use procedural fairings. Please stop telling me about it. I know all about procedural fairings. I published one of the first videos on procedural fairings. I do not need to know about procedural fairings. Of course, that means that half a dozen of you will, of course, post some uh, comment about procedural fairings just for a giggle. Oh, you guys are so smart. Oh, how droll. Well... I'm sure you think it's a good idea, and I would love to agree with you, but then we would both be wrong. Regardless, <laughs> we are inserting ourselves into orbit. For some reason, uh, for some reason, Kerbal Engineer freaks out a lot randomly. I don't think it's exactly compatible with this. all these mods. I have a few bugs here and there. So, yeah, we got to do a big, uh, you know, rendezvous. This is going to take a long time. But the good thing is we have time acceleration and we can skip chunks of the video. Since you don't want to watch me rendezvousing from half a world away. So, let me see. What are we doing? We're I don't know. I guess I was plugging around with the descending nodes. Trying to trying to uh, align the orbits here. That's the important thing. Is a... Uh, Launch these things. Oh yeah, I launched these things really stupidly while I was launching. I was looking at the map and aligning the orbits with the space station only to realize that I was supposed to be aligning my orbits with the Duna Drive unit. That was a work of genius from me. From old me. I'm sure I'm older and smarter now. I'm certainly a lot more tired after Christmas. Boy, I got some... Well, the kids got some amazing stuff, and I got an interesting gizmo called an Astrolabe, which I will have to explain to you in a video sometime. An Astrolabe being an old uh, device used for telling time and making date predictions and horoscopes and astronomy and astrology and surveying. It's pretty awesome. Okay, so what we're just doing is, again, more plugging around with maneuver nodes. A 14.5 meter per second burn. It's not really really so much a burn with RCS as it is a silent hiss in the vacuum of space. That's what these RCS ones sound like. Um, real RCS units are actually quite noisy when they're tested. They're quite impressive, actually, to see these things, because they can. The, the whole thing about RCS engines is that they have to be able to turn on and off very quickly. So uh, there's a video where they were testing for the Apollo program, and they had one RCS unit that was just firing all the time, continuously, so it had to sustain thrust for like a minute. And another one, which was having to, you know, stutter, so they were testing the, the ability to turn on and off very quickly. And, uh, you know, it's quite impressive that you have to solve a lot of these things to make it work, and they obviously managed it, and they got to the moon. Okay, and it's going to be another nighttime rendezvous. We're just going into the dark side. Hopefully, it will become daytime soon. There we go. Ah, uh, Duna Drive Unit, 1.8 kilometers out. We're just going to be poking these things and shoveling these things and hopefully docking these things very soon. So we'll be carrying the fuel, which will carry us to Duna. We will uh, need to refill that uh, because of my ineptitude in actually hand-calculating everything. As I said, um, Kerbal Engineer didn't work, and I did a kind of rough sketch as to what I thought I would need, and I clearly underestimated. Uh, <laughs> which means more missions. I, I think actually, well, this is all in post-commentary. Given that the schedule for building this Duna Drive is, is is very tight, they have to get it built in time for the launch window, they're going to have to ask the aviation team for help here. So the aviation team will probably repurpose one of their you know shuttle-style vehicles, send it up, and uh, m maybe make it do the refueling. It will probably be a bigger and heavier and actually more useful mission than they have done so far. 
As for those wor- worrying about Landmer Kerman, uh, Hangar 18 is still investigating, but unfortunately building the Duna spacecraft is really the top priority right now because I need to hit that launch window. And there we go! Look at that! Doesn't that start to look the part there? It has RCS units there and everything. So we're going to keep... See that fairing thing? We're actually going to keep that behind. That's part of the design because I thought it looked cool. So I'd have to be very careful not to actually... Uh, hit the staging button at any time, otherwise my spacecraft will be ruined. That would not be good. Uh, so yeah, this is us your standard descent path where we uh, more or less drop this into the atmosphere and let it decay. Funny thing that happened on the way down, which you'll probably have guessed since I post a video uh, about lifting bodies. This thing actually worked pretty well as a lifting body. Just watch how well this thing flies. Unfortunately, bringing it down softly would require probably some landing gear and things like that. But uh, you'll just see this thing. We burn through the atmosphere 1,000 degrees, but that's still fine. There's some mountains there. Look, we're actually coming down on the original continent, on the launch, the continent with the launch center. So watch the vertical speed here, right? Like, I literally managed to lift up, and I'm just a cylinder of, you know, small parts here. <laughs> this was where I got my idea to try to actually build lifting bodies. So anyway, back to old me, who has just discovered that his vehicle can actually fly. Okay, um, I, I'm not entirely sure, but this thing does appear to be flying. I think Ferrum Aerospace has added some, like, awesome new, uh you know, aerodynamic properties to the bodies, but this thing is actually flying. I can't see anything, I can't see the ground, but I'm going to try soft landing this thing. Look, sliding down, and I'm going to start flaring when I think the ground is close. Does that look like the ground? Does anyone see any ground scatter? Ground scatter that everybody always, you know, asks me how I have ground scatter. How, why do I have trees? I have trees because I click the experimental ground scatter option, which, uh, is labelled as experimental, and I would dearly love it this year, Mr. Squad people, if you actually make it... Oh, darn! Hey, oh, wait, did something survive? No, well, never mind. That was, that was impressive. I gotta make that better. It's okay, enough of old me again, and back to flying bits and pieces of rockets. So, this is going to be uh, a lab module, which is going to go on the back of, or it's not the lab module, this is a habitation module and everything else. We don't have labs yet, except for the ones in Interstellar. Uh, because I'm waiting so long for the for uh, point two three to be completely compatible with all my mods, or for all my mods to be compatible with point two three, I may actually just launch the mission using the Interstellar labs and then say that they have the same capabilities as the labs in... Um, as the actual official lab units. I, I don't know. I'm just totally guessing what's going on here. So yeah, again, it's a case of packing all this into a rocket that will actually fly. Now, we're putting this onto a lower orbit because the uh, the station, not the station, the, the what do you call it? That whole uh, that uh, spacecraft, the Grand Adventure to Duna, is, a, is in an orbit in front of me. Therefore, I have to be lower and faster than it to catch up. Uh, so, yeah, we make her burn into orbit, and we have to be careful here, because, of course, we want to ditch the rocket uh, into the atmosphere so that it will uh, return and not crowd up my uh, altitude, my uh, orbit. After all, we're building things up here. It would suck if we crashed into something there. Abandon it into an orbit that's about 50 kilometers up. That's uh, just about low enough that it'll die in a couple of orbits, if, but you have to actually switch to it. So if you leave them so that they go below 20, then they will automatically work. Look at that marvellous thing, eh? It has radiators, solar panels, it has a lab, and it all fits inside the fairings, the standard parts in KW rocketry, right? That was really the whole, you know, the hardest part about this. We have had to fit all the instrumentation and everything into this small area. So uh, that will be the permanent habitation module, which is attached to the spacecraft. Uh, the rest of the spacecraft will pretty much land on Duna, more or less. There might be some other stuff. I'm not. I'm not really sure just yet. But uh, we definitely need at least space for four Kerbals to kind of stretch their legs, in addition to the actual capsule that they'll be flying in. This is intended to take three Kerbals to Duna, and obviously. We're going to launch their probe last, or their spacecraft last, because 
we don't want them sitting in space cooling their heels. We want, we're doing all the process, all the building process, largely uh, using automated systems here. Now, uh, a very important thing here is I want to make sure that the uh, panels and everything are perpendicular to the location of those engines. I want those engines to have a clear path down the side of the, the hull so that they can burn without actually hitting anything. Now, after a certain distance, it isn't going to matter, but all the same, I want to build my spacecraft in such a way that I can do that. So I've aligned all my panels and my radiators so that they are at 90 degrees to this. And I, apparently I went and didn't line up my tank and everything correctly, but that's it. That's, uh, that's starting to look really like a spacecraft. It has a lot of functional hardware on there, and it has a place to stay, but it still has no way of internally controlling itself. It's still a dead hulk floating in space. And by hulk, I mean, you know, a big chunk of, you know, spacecraft, not a, a hulk, not like Bruce Banner, a big green man floating in space, because that would be really silly. But we are not silly. We are sensible. We are going to go to... We're going to send this thing back to the planet Kerbin from whence it came, and we are going to launch another mission. Okay, so the final mission of the day is... It's another shuttle mission, or it's another space vehicle mission. This thing is a bit bigger and heavier than anything before. Although the fuel fits into the cargo bay just fine, it is heavier than anything we've had to fly on this. So, we have those extra big boosters, making the spacecraft look bigger and chunkier and less aerodynamic than before. But after ditching them at uh, you know, 20 plus kilometers, we're flying just fine. Now you'll notice that I have Jebediah and Bill coming along, and I know these guys aren't really supposed to be used, but all the other astronauts are up to really, really important things, right? Jebediah and Bill have a reason for being here. They're, they are the test pilots, right? They know about flying experimental vehicles and doing these things. Although, so though this is a mission which is essential to the space program, it is also technically a test flight for the heavy lifter version of this. Therefore, they are allowed to do it. I, I, they're totally not there because I accidentally let them fly. Uh, no, and I didn't. It's not because I didn't realize until after I docked that I was flying with Jebediah and Bill. No, because how can you not notice that Jebediah is there since he brings the awesome, right? He is like the distilled awesome. If you, you know, well, look, it's Jebediah and Bill, and they're flying a mission. They're flying this shuttle. Notice that uh, I couldn't actually even get above the surface of Kerbin. We uh, had to burn. Uh, we ended up, well, we ended up with our apoaps underneath the surface. Therefore, uh, this is a very long, slow insertion that actually took a really, really tedious amount of time. Um, so yeah, let's just skip all that because this is all post commentary, right? Uh, with a bit of work, we uh, get to the docking area now. So. We still are maintaining that little, uh, the hinged body there, right? See that hinge thing folds up, including the docking area, the docking port on it. So that's how we're going to actually attach to this and transfer the fuel over. Again, uh, the transfer and everything, the, the coordinate system for the, the navigation, everything works just fine. It's really credit to the producers that this actually behaves like that. Okay, so we're gonna slide in and up. This is almost like a real shuttle docking, of course. You know, this is how the real shuttle would dock, except that it would uh, it would come in from a different angle. They actually use a completely different approach mechanism that is designed to stop RCS engines firing towards the International Space Station. So they actually plan their approach from a lot further out. It's actually quite a quite interesting to actually look at the mechanics of how these things rendezvous and, and dock. It's not as simple as, as we have it in Kerbal Space Program. Plus, their Delta V bu budgets are way, way lower. Anyway, we're there, we're docked. We have some fuel transfer to do. We got a whole pile of fuel in the back of this. And uh, we'll continue the mission in the next episode. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. <laughs>